Okay, uh, let's start. So thank you, Daria, for coming. And uh, today we are going to talk about MA program, translation and modern technologies in linguistic. So Daria, please tell us about yourself. About me? So I have been um, a student of this uh, MA pro program and I've also studied in uh, here in Hunter Mansisk in our regional university and um, obtained my bachelor's degree. So probably that's it. Currently I'm uh, teaching uh, children. I'm not uh, translating anymore. Um, so just education is uh, a bit more interesting and, um, you know, seems to be more awesome for me. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And um, can you please tell what is your educational background? So as I said, um, I, get, I got my bachelor's degree here in Hunter Matisk. Then I um, have spent a month in Germany. It was just like some kind of an exchange course. It was a nice experience, but um, unfortunately, I don't really remember any of my German now. So uh, that's it, I believe. Um, so bachelor's degree in linguistics and then a master's degree in translation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, now please uh, tell us about what was your strategy to search MA program. So I think you were thinking about different uh, uh, programs. So what was your strategy? How did you look for uh, these MA programs? So I just wanted to do something really exciting. And uh, I've actually entered uh, one of the best translation schools in the world, um, which is located in Monterey, California. But pandemic started, so I wasn't able to leave the country. And I finally just um, thought that probably it would be better to search for something well, here in Russia. Um, so that's how I found, well, maybe not found, but I, I thought of um, submitting my papers, my documents to um, GIMO, which is Moscow State Institute of International Technology relations, sorry, uh, in Moscow, Russia. Mm -hmm. So uh, I understood it correctly. So you had only, I don't know, two options. And uh, uh, I mean, that's one that abroad university and um, GIMO. Or maybe you were searching uh, another programs in different university or you decided strictly go to the um, GIMO. Sure, I, I also had some some more options, of course. I just named the main of them. Um, so my actually my first option in Moscow was the MSU, which is Moscow State University, um, named by named after Lomonosov. And uh, I wanted to pursue my translation career there as well. So translation or maybe interpretation didn't really matter to me at that time. So um, after I um, after after I uh, got acquainted with the program, with the students' plan, so to speak, with disciplines, with some reviews, I opted for um, Gibo. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so you've mentioned uh, all of these uh, opportunities like curriculum, program, and so on. Uh, so please tell us about the program in general. So what blocks it has? I don't know, maybe you have uh, the most uh, parts, uh, biggest, the translation, or maybe you have, I don't know, half and half translation and modern technologies. I, I don't know, maybe computer studies. So what was this uh, program about? So, um, actually, at first, I wanted to choose another one, but I failed uh, to get to enter uh, because uh, it costed much more than uh, the program that I actually um, chose eventually. Uh, so, the first program in, in GIMO was all about tran interpretation, translation as well, um, public relations, not public, but international relations. Um, you know, all these things, maybe politics, um, a lot of um, law uh, terms, terminology, and uh, um, I was really, really, really attracted by it, but I failed. So I had to opt for um, something that I had to pay for. So 
it wasn't not it wasn't free anymore for me so i opted i've chosen this um, modern technologies uh, curriculum program because it um it was spinning so to speak um, around modern technology so obviously about it was all about using traders uh, about um using some uh, corpora linguistics uh, corpora are uh, just some technolo technological stuff that we translations translators can use in our jobs mm, so um you asked me about the main blocks of course they were um international communication obviously and then relations uh, there was uh, a trans there was translation of um let me think um of some law texts of some political texts um then we had to learn the this big block of computer studies uh actually we had some disciplines connected with them but the main one of course was um studying traders and learning how to work with it and also some corpora corporal linguistics um there was one more but i can't 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 think of it right, right now so um, okay and uh, more specific question uh did you have uh i don't know different type of uh i don't know learning how to translate written and uh, simultaneous translation right so you have different kind of activities so it's not just uh, i don't know uh, written how to uh, translate written uh, languages, but also uh, how to do simultaneous uh, translation. I mean, speaking. Trans sure, we had uh, we had we had interpretation, we had simultaneous interpretation, we had uh, written translation, as you said, um, a big block of economic uh, translation as well, which I really liked. It was a uh, quite comprehensive. Well, um, we also. Uh, I, I think that's it. Yeah, there was like the main, 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 main courses of uh, of the work, but they all happened in only, only in the second year. In the second year, in our first year, we um were more about this uh, system of translation translators science that help you uh, code the text, so to speak, when you hear it. When you code it in uh, in a specific manner, and then you can uh, you know just interpret it uh, consecutively. Yeah, it's called consecutive interpretation. I just um, it was just hard for me to remember the word the word. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Wow, interesting program. So it seems like you have a combination of the translation plus uh, computer science. Let's uh, let's say it so, and also you have uh, translation in different scientific fields like economics, uh, jurisprudence, uh, and so on. <laughs> okay. Sure. Nice. Um, mm -hmm. So we've talked about the program in general, and now please tell about the admission. So the first question, are the admission requirements um, I don't know, such as an essay, making a portfolio, um, doing interviews. So tell please about the admi admission. Well, I'm not really sure what admission requirements are this year, but two years ago when I was a freshman, <laughs> not really a freshman to graduate, right? Um, so I had to write an essay. Mm, we didn't have any requirements for a portfolio but it was an essay on the topic um, on some on, on one of the topics of um, international communication and we also had to translate a text which was um, given to us uh, just really just immediately so the exam started it was uh, online of course not not really online so everybody got their text they got their um, exercise tasks um via email so we had to do them really really quickly in about an hour or an hour and a half I'm not really sure and we had to send it back in 60 minutes it was written 60 minutes oh okay 
So um, I remember that I was doing it, trying to do it really quickly because um, translating a text wasn't really um, hard. It was a little bit tricky, but well, I got a pretty a pretty good mark then. But um, writing an essay on that topic was a challenge for me because I really didn't have that much of an experience experience that much of knowledge in this field so I had to you know to make it up actually I made it up and I made it look um, quite convincing so to speak and I think that uh, I was just just I was just lucky so they uh, they they took my you know my fantasies my um, suggestions on the topic and they um, let me go. Let me let me enter the university. Actually, there were twenty five people who were um, trying to meet these requirements uh, at the time. Twenty five, right? Twenty five. Yeah, yeah. Twenty five, and uh, only twelve of them. Thirteen, only thirteen. So we half passed. So that's it. No interview. Nothing. Nothing else. Mm -hmm. And uh, was it difficult in general? Oh, it's. It's okay. So as I said, it was, it was hard for me, but oh. of course it wasn't. Really, it, it it shouldn't be really hard for for a person who deals with international communication, with uh, uh, differences in cultures, so like on a daily basis. Or maybe have read for yeah. someone who has read about in, in the past. Yeah, um, it was not my case. So uh, it was summer, and uh, well, I, I remember that it was really hot. My parents were at home. I had to close my doors I had to isolate myself as much as I could, um, trying to type my text um, literally on my tablet. So not even not even on my laptop. So, you know, just the, the situation was a little bit stressful for me. And of course, I'm not really happy with my work, but it was good enough. It was enough for me to to enter. So mm -hmm. I'm okay. quite satisfied. Uh, just imagine that, for example, uh, us uh, listening, the people who may be also not with good with uh, uh, an, uh, writing an essay. So what kind of uh, life hacks you can give um, according to your experience? So what you can recommend to do? Well, not much, really, because I tried to, um, there was a there was a set of recommended literature before the exam on the on the side, so you could read it. You could, you know, be a little bit prepared for your exam. Um, it didn't help actually because um, they were not not really um, spinning about spinning around um, some terms, terminology, some specific vocabulary or something, but you had to understand the situation correctly. I remember that in my essay, they they gave you. Um, the text, a text, um, and it was about some cultural situation, some situation in cultural differences. So you had to describe it. You had to um, explain what happened and what you could do to maybe, um, you know, to smoothen um, all those differences, to uh, mediate their. Uh, you know, inconsistencies in their uh, communication. And of course, I, I just wasn't, I just wasn't qualified enough for this stuff. So what I can suggest is just um, reading about different cultures and trying to read as much as you can. That's it. No more good tips for me. Sorry. Okay. Well, really good. Um... Okay, and uh, maybe just quick information. So you've told like uh, you had to pay for your um, program, making this program. So uh, how much uh, did it cost? So I actually got a sale, a pretty big one, 10%. And uh, I had to pay 3,000 rubles for my first year. It was about $5,000 in the time. And for my second year, um, I had to pay 90,000 rubles less because I was uh, yeah, successful enough. So I passed all my first year exams with uh, A's, so five, five points on each, a, uh, on each exam. And I have had my credits on, on, on each, uh, on every exam. So I was uh, so lucky <laughs> to get a, to get a pretty, pretty good sale uh, then. 
so it was not not I'm sorry it was not ninety thousand less I believe it was um I believe I believe it was thirty thousand less because I paid ninety okay <laughs> I'm not really sure I just I just keep remembering this uh, number and I remember that uh, they can give you a discount. Not a silly discount, sorry. Yeah, they can give you a discount uh, if you are a good student. So I've had this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Um, okay, now let's uh, uh, dive in into the courses. And um, uh, please tell me how many courses are there per semester? I really can't say because uh, a year has passed, has passed. So um, it was. Uh, there were there were not so many, you could say, but I really am not sure about the exact number. I just remember that they changed. So you have a course. It um, lasts for about a month or two months, maybe three months. Then it ends. That you have then you have another one, another one, another one. So you always um, you're always busy. You always have your curriculum very packed, but. Uh, I can say how many really. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I I've seen the small piece of information on the website of this program that uh, uh, you can work and study uh, during this uh, program. So is it uh, really so, or maybe there uh, there were some difficulties with it? I don't know, or maybe no, everything is great and people can work and study. Well, that's the the most painful part for us students, I believe, because um, you can work and study, of course, but only if your work um, can be very flexible, if you work part-time, if you can choose your own hours for working. Um, for example, you're a private tutor or maybe you are um, a translator who can work at night, maybe at early in the early morning, um, in the evening, evening you know so you don't have just strict schedule for your um, work time people all the people who had uh, their schedules strict or maybe who had to be at work at just at some at some exact time um they all left either their work or their study so it, uh, they were told, of course, that they would be able to do this. Uh, it wasn't possible, really, at all. I'm not sure um, about the situation this year, in this year, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, but when I was a student, it was a great, great stress and a great problem because you could only work and study if you if you could uh, negotiate, you know, and uh, teachers, professors, sorry, uh, and, um, you know, all the other staff at the university weren't really, um, they didn't really give you that much of a space for, uh, for movement first, for options. You had to be on some, on some um, classes, at some classes, uh, you had to be on some um, credits, of course. Uh, there were days, there were times that you couldn't leave. No, because you could, of course, came later, maybe pass your exam, pass your credit, give you a paper. But uh, as far as I know, students used to have really, really big problems with it. So you shouldn't... Um, you shouldn't think or have a lot of hope that you would be able to work in the evening, work in the morning, maybe in the early afternoon, then go to university, do a little bit of house, uh, sorry, a little bit of homework, and then that's it. No, there would be a lot of homework, a lot of studying. So I wouldn't recommend um, using this type of you know, attitude uh, to anybody to anybody because uh, you could um, get yourself in, you know, find yourself in a really dire position. So probably it would be better if you just uh, found some more flexible part-time job. 
uh, for a while, or maybe if you saved some money so you could um, let yourself not work at all, at least for some time. Uh, when you come, you come around in the city, when you understand it, all this uh, traffic system, all this, um, you know, trains, metro, um, very, very long distances, because it also, it takes you a lot of time to get to the university. So uh, um, actually it was located in outside Moscow. So in one of the suburban areas, or better to say in, in one small town, uh, which was near it. So um, better not to think that you can work very freely there. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you live near this uh, university? No, of course not. Uh, yeah, it would be a good idea to rent a room, maybe, in this very town, small town where it was located. But um, I had uh, I had a great opportunity of living in Moscow, not very far from it. So I had a friend who had to wake up, uh, then spent about two and a half two and a half hours every day just to get to it. And I mean buses, I mean uh, trains, and I mean metro, so subway, yep. Then she had to go on food, of course, and the whole journey was about two and a half hours. Then she had to go back. So five hours a day just for commu uh, commuting, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I was much, much, much luckier, so I had to spend only one and a half hour every day, or I could spend uh, even less if I chose not to work, not to walk, sorry, but to use uh, subway. So about one hour and 10 minutes like that. And I have to say that that's uh, a standard time um, time period <laughs> that you commute. One and a half hour is just, you know, okay. It, it's, it's really, really great. It, was there any dormitory opportunities or you had to, I don't know, find the living places uh, by yourself. As far as I know, in the main building, if you enter in the main Gimo courses in the main, um, in the main place in Moscow, uh, there are some dormitories. Um, I believe they are given at first to to students who, of course, don't live in Moscow or Moscow region, and who. Um, I'm not sure how to say it. So who study for free, who don't have to pay for their studies. They have uh, very good points, so, so they can get uh, those um, dormitories. We were master degrees, master's degree students, and uh, we could rent a small flat, a small room in Gimo Hotel. So actually that's the place, like the real hotel, or um, very, very nice nice, very, you know, fancy dormitory, so to speak, which is located really, really close to the university, to the building in that small town where I um, used to study. But uh, the fee was, of course, uh, very high for, for me, for a student. But there are people who live there. Unfortunately, I can't tell you anything about their, um, you know, conditions, living conditions, but uh, there is uh, some information on the site, so you can go and check uh, what you can get for, for money that you can pay. So mm -hmm. that's it. Okay, thank you. Could you please um, think about one uh, day and describe the most typical study day? Uh, when begins? Maybe um, uh, tell about how many um, classes do you have? Did you have sorry uh, for that and uh, when it ends <laughs> so just uh, describe the most typical study day how it looks like so all right i would probably describe you uh, the typical studying day um starting from the point when you wake up because you usually have your classes in the afternoon not usually you always have them in the afternoon of course so um before noon uh, in the morning, you have to do your homework, um, do some housework, uh, prepare your clothes, you know, just regular stuff. 
shall you wake up you do your homework as much as you can as long as you can then you um you eat you get dressed you go out of your accommodation place then you spend as i said one or one and a half uh, two hours like that commuting to your place of studying uh, you can uh, read in the train you can do some homework as well uh, you can get a little walk if you can if you're able then um this typical study day used to start um well sometimes it started at around three o'clock in the afternoon sometimes it was even earlier like uh one one and a half o'clock, you know, half past one. Um, sometimes it was even. I'm not. I'm not really sure, but I believe that we some we had to come. No, I believe it was like one or half um, half past one. So you see, you can't really take any job when you have to be at the university at half past one. So working only in the early morning, there are not so much so many jobs that can allow you to do this. So then you have uh, about four or three periods. I mean, classes, yeah, they're called periods where you have to, um, when you study for two academic hours, then you um, can go home. Sometimes you come later at four o'clock. So you, you can leave your university at nine, probably um, around nine or uh, even half past nine, so quite quite late, then you commute back. So typically I would uh, come back at 11 o'clock in the evening. So, and after that you, uh, well, I'm an early riser, so I usually feel quite exhausted at the time. Uh, you try to get something to eat and um, just take a bath, you know, something really basic and you just go you know, to sleep, that's it. And it, it, it sort of goes around and around each day, every day, because a lot of there is a lot of homework. So uh, we used to have, of course, days off. Um, we usually were free on Sunday. We were always free on Sunday. And uh, Saturday was a study day, but we had one more um, day off during the week. It was either Wednesday or maybe Friday. So you, um, you spend like five days studying usually, but of course there were times in our curriculum, uh, in our studying period, and we had to study for six days. So quite a lot. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, okay, maybe I would like to ask about um, faculty members. Uh, can you tell me about uh, some faculty members and uh, about the experience, about the background, um, just uh, in general a little bit? Well, in general, of course, there are people with a quite rich background. Um, there were real interpreters there. There were real translators there. Um, there were real psychologists there who who taught us this uh, discipline. Um, but uh, well, as I see it, uh, it's not uh, it's not enough for a faculty member to be great at some um at some job you see translation or psychology or maybe or um, you know linguistics in general just theoretical linguistics uh, it's very important for a faculty member to be a real teacher because uh, when you can't communicate your uh, knowledge in a very effective manner it's not very important um, what kind of a background you have so, um, uh, in general, it was okay. There were some really, really great people. One of them has passed. Um, one of them passed, yeah, sadly, but um, he was like the best there. Um, all in all, in general, it was uh, it was okay. 
I wouldn't say it was really bad. I wouldn't say it was really great. Just to a regular, the just the regular um, staff situation as you have in in every higher education institution, I believe so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I understood you correctly, you had more people from the industry. Um, maybe not some of them were the teachers who really know how to teach, uh, but uh, they were most from the industry. Not, not really so. Uh, actually, there were only two disciplines, say translation and interpretation, that's it. And they were taught by to disciplines, to, to teach, teachers, to professors, obviously. And all the other uh, disciplines, they were only connected to this thing in some kind of way. So they, of course, they were disciplines connected with international communication. So people who taught us were quite well-versed, well-versed in it. But um, if if we speak about people who were from the industry i really would appreciate if they were more of them because when one of them passed uh, we were only left with uh, one and uh, one of them and one uh, and one more teacher who was just uh, who wasn't really teaching us uh, translation she was teaching us how to work with traders so um i wasn't really interested in all the theoretical disciplines because I had them in my during my bachelor's degree years, and I wanted to do a lot of practice to, you know, um, to go somewhere to be to to feel um, really confident in my knowledge in my skills, and uh, I really felt like I was it, my my curriculum was lacking some of those things. Okay, so you've mentioned that you would like to uh, have more hands-on projects, I, I don't know, maybe internships, so the questions can go there. Um, so are there any hands-on projects available for the student during this program? Uh, did you have um, any kind of internship? Uh, did you have such opportunities? Yeah, that's the, the funniest question, I believe. I'm really not sure how the situation is right now. But uh, when I was a freshman, they told us, uh, actually it was, um, you know, an experimental program. Program, we were the first, um, the first year that would, um, the first class that would um, pass this uh, program. And uh, it was said that we would have a lot of hands-on projects, a lot of internships in you know, during summer, during the time when you have those things. Uh, in international organizations, in uh, very interesting institutions, um, they were they were all international, and I was like, of course, uh, it must be a very, must be a very 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 great opportunity experience. But after we finished our first year, it turned out that actually nobody would like to take us. So. Uh, nobody would take us, nobody was interested in us, uh, nobody would uh, give us the opportunity to go to any international institution at all, to any serious, at my, to my point of view, institution at all. We were given some opportunities. One of them was to uh, translate at a library. And some of us uh, went there. Mm, another some other uh, students, including me, were were offered a place of um, yeah some internship, you could say so, for two weeks in a translation company in Moscow. Of course, it was just a yeah, it was very interesting. It was beautiful. It was great. There were a lot of people. It was big, but it was still just a translation company. And uh, all that you did there was working with their papers you know uh, working with their uh, files uh, with their archives maybe and just a little little bit of uh, translating and we didn't even get a feedback for our work you mean i mean uh, the translation work so i uh, i actually didn't finish this internship because i 
I just didn't see any, you know, any anything, any benefits from it. And uh, they, I, I tried, I tried to find some place for internship myself, myself, by myself. Sorry, <laughs> I found uh, um, an audio visual translation company, and they asked for a test um, task for me. And when I submitted it, they uh, they just told me that no, 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 thank you. You are very, uh, you're very poor at it. Whereas I am, I didn't have the course. Uh, so you have a little, a lot, a lot of mistakes. Uh, you have to pass our own um, course on this translate audiovisual translation, which costed about sixty thousand dollars. So quite a lot, a thousand, oh, sixty thousand rubles. Sorry, uh, one thousand dollars at the time. So I didn't really want to pay for my own internship, internship, once again. So you know, the whole education was paid. So that situation really, really uh, was really exciting for me. But some people um, who were translating for some other companies um, had the opportunity to uh, finish their internship there. It was uh, compulsory. So that's it. <laughs> no more hands-on projects, no more uh, internships, no more <laughs> nothing. <laughs> that's it. So uh, we've talked about uh, uh, hands-on project and internship. And uh, what about research projects? Are there any research research project during your study, or this uh, MA program more about to get some specific uh, translation uh, skills? More, I don't know uh, how to say. Uh, very strict to job uh, skills and not uh, doing any kind of research. Well, of course, you always have some research research projects because you have to submit your year paper each year, obviously. Uh, so we had a year, we didn't have a year paper in the first one, but after our second year, we had to um, we have to present our uh, final year uh, program, uh, a final year paper. So of course you do a lot, a lot, a lot of research for that. And uh, yeah, you can you can use um, everything and anything that you can think of. Actually, Gimo has a very um, comprehensive online library as well, which is free for use um, to students. For students, uh, they also have some opportunities to look uh, in other uh, online libraries so there is no lacking of you know uh, the scientific literature academic literature mm -hmm. okay uh, good um so another one question this will be about your uh so this is not a translation but also um modern technologies in linguistic and translation. So I have a question about uh, these um, technologies. So of course, in the curriculum, and as you said, uh, uh, there are some courses related to technologies in linguistic. And uh, could you please tell, um, of course, I understood that you've uh, learned Tradis. And um, uh, did you learn something other? Maybe they showed you some, I don't know, another one, technologies, or all it was about uh, Tratus. So, I mean, was there anything else which related to the modern technologies or the modern technologies? It's only about uh, how to learn how to use Tratus and the tool. Yeah, it was only only about Tratus, you're right. We also had some uh, lock, some track. Are connected to corporal linguistics, corpus linguistics, yeah, corpora. But I wouldn't, of course, they are very useful for some scientific, uh, scientific, uh, you know, goals. But for me, I really didn't, um, I didn't really understand how to use them in my daily work. But of course, of course, the 
it's great to know them and it's great to know how to use them. Um, nothing else, actually. And we didn't have, oh, it, it would have more, actually, it would have had more of traders um, classes because they were, they were really dull, you know. And uh, at first, we just had to get acquainted with the program. Uh, there were some uh, free to use programs, but we had them only in our university building. So you couldn't download the program on your personal computer. And it was insanely inconvenient because, as I said, uh, we had to spend a lot of time at the university. We had to commute to the university. Um, it took us uh, a lot of time as well. And to think that you you have to work, you have to do some housework, you have to, you know, just to wash your clothes, so do some basic cleaning at, at home, and also go back to the university to, to study to work on the computers with traders. Um, well, it just it, it just just wasn't meant to be, you know. It just wasn't uh, it was just wasn't possible for us. I don't know anybody who actually uh, worked this way. Maybe somebody did, but I just don't know any 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 of those people. So um, you couldn't download it. You could download it only for uh, for a month, so to speak, your your demo version, and then you had to pay seven thousand rubles. I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, which actually nobody ever did. So, so I believe somebody paid that sum of money. Uh, well, I'm not really sure. So, um, of course, you could learn how to use other um, technolo technological solutions for translation, but you had to do it by yourself. That's it. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, you told me that it's possible to learn uh, by yourself how to use uh, traders, just uh, watching, I don't know, some training online courses uh, uh, on YouTube and other educational platforms. Uh, sure, traders have, <laughs> you know, the company, they have a pretty great website, which um, has a lot of information there, a lot of instructions there. They also or provide you with um, some materials um, in the form of a PDF file, so sort of like an ebook. You can read it. There are a lot of pictures. You can just use it as a manual for your um, learning. But you, of course, you have to have um, the program on your laptop. If it's somewhere that you have commute to commute there, then you come back, then you read, then you read there. That you you don't have the opportunity to open it whenever you want, whenever you need it. Of course, it's not working, but. <clears throat> Uh, if we had an opportunity to install the program on our laptops for free, or maybe for some, uh, with you know, with some discount, it would be better for us. Um, sure, you can watch some videos. There are there are some, and there are some training materials, as, as I said. And after you feel you are okay with that, you can pass an exam, which is issued by traders themselves. You can get a certificate, certificate uh, which confirms that you are a, a good user of traders. Actually, we had to learn to get that certificate, and it was quite, um, you know, quite absurd for me because nobody really used. Uh, eventually, nobody really used uh, the system, but we had to, we had to um, pass the tests. Uh, the training tests over and over and over again just to pass this exam because if we did it would mean that we have a credit that we had a credit um for a university and if we didn't we had to um obtain a very low mark so nobody wanted that and we had to you know just study for the sake of studying nothing practical at the end it looked like that so at the end closer to the end it became just meaningless just nonsense and nobody really understood why do we have to do that really so of course now everybody has a certificate of a great <laughs> traders user but this doesn't mean that we can work with a program mm -hmm. okay uh now let's move uh 
move on to the cohort. Uh, please tell me about your cohort. So um, was there any international uh, students or um, where did they come from? What kind of cities? So just some basic information. So it was pandemic, of course, no <laughs> international students in Moscow at the time. Um, I think so. At least in my uh, students group, they were, they were, I believe nearly everyone was from Moscow or from Moscow region. Uh, there were only two people, if I'm not mistaken, who were not from the army and one more person, that's it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is their, what was their background? Um, also linguistics or maybe they come, came from different uh, scientific fields? Linguistics, um, teaching, philology, um, translation, maybe, um, maybe, uh, and one person came from uh, economics, so he got his bachelor's degree in one of the best economic universities in Moscow, I believe so, but he said himself that he was a, a pretty bad economist, so he wanted to turn his life around. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, can you provide any information about uh, uh, about your cohort graduates and um, what kind of uh, the uh, career uh, outcomes they have? So, um, of course, we they all entered with the hope of becoming great interpreters, translators, working in in. Uh, in uh, um, you know, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, working in uh, different national organizations, but closer to the end uh, and after the ending of our studies, uh, a lot of them and a lot of us understood that it wasn't really, um, it wasn't as as easy as we imagined it to be. Um, it wasn't easy, even with the uh, diplomas of the best, you know, university one of the best universities in countries in the country and um, there were people who translated as students uh, like full-time or part-time and then they eventually started teaching as well being private tutors there were people um, who got some places some openings in uh, translation in different in different institutions in some organizations but their salary was insanely low so they uh, they also some of them work there still some of them left and just um, opted for a much 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 more lucrative job of a private tutor mm -hmm. That's it. okay and you also uh, became um yeah including uh, me including me yeah mm -hmm. sure teaching students mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so now we are going to the conclusion. <laughs> um, what are the best and worst thing about the program, in your opinion? Um, the best and the worst. Um, the worst thing, I believe, is that not a lot of things that were promised to us, like I said, internships, some great opportunities, some connections. <laughs> um, some uh, disciplines, some uh, in some 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 materials that uh, we had to get, um, they weren't really provided to us um, due to due to different reasons, various reasons, and uh, so actually the idea that you have when you enter the university and the feeling that you have them when you actually finish it. Well, they are they are they are extremely different. They are just they're just opposite, I believe. You enter full of hopes, uh, at least I did. And a lot of my friends who were in my setting group, we entered with one um, idea with one image of what our studying and what our postgraduate life would look like. And uh, when it actually happened to us, uh, well, I, I can say that we felt really happy. Because uh, we understood that, well, we've spent a lot of money and we didn't obtain 
um, the thing that we actually came for. So for a lot of us, I would say that uh, this study was pretty useless. You can you can say so because nobody is translating anymore. Nobody of us. And we actually um, entered the translation and modern technologies program. And we all we all are teachers or private tutors these days. Most of us, most of us. Um, but the best thing, well, the best thing was, you know, living in Moscow, just getting dipped into this wonderful vibe of the best best city of the in the world, I believe. I really think that that's the best city, <laughs> you know, from all the capitals, from all the big cities. I haven't seen a lot of them, but I have seen some. And I think Moscow is um, is a perfect place to spend a year, two years of your life, or when you don't have a family to feed, where you are, you know, relatively free. And also seeing a lot of very ex mm, inspiring people. Because people who live in Moscow, people who strive, people who work for their dream they usually are very you know enthusiastic very strong-minded they are very confident uh, they um, they see the future they are visionaries and uh, just feeling this this constant atmosphere of uh, developing of going somewhere of not not stopping for a minute well, it can be stressful, but I would also say that it was the best thing that you actually can't can find anywhere. Mm, but uh, this this place, this uh, university, this city, um, one of the best things was, was also that uh, well, you actually get a pretty, pretty, pretty great education. You don't get a lot of um, you don't get as much practice as you wanted, maybe. You don't get uh, everything that you <laughs> were promised, obviously. You um, have your dreams, your, your you know, your um, your unicorn dreams a little bit shattered, obviously. But still, uh, your level of education is uh, one of the highest. It's, it's one of the big, it's one of the best education levels that you can obtain in our country and maybe in a lot of other countries. So. Um, it's a great that's a great way of developing yourself that's a great way of um, challenging yourself uh, but still you have to you have to be um, you have to have some background you have to have some money some uh, uh, place to live um, some um, some clear idea what you are here for because uh, many of us who entered we were just they, they were just dreaming we were just dreaming about some great life some great job opportunities that would magically be given to us maybe after we finished the university and of course it wasn't so so mm -hmm. i think that's it <laughs> okay and the last uh, two questions uh, very very short are you happy with your choice and uh, if you could make a choice again how would you choose the program did you do this in a different way or not? So uh, me particularly, I'm not happy with the choice at all. I was, uh, yeah, as I said, it was a great experience. But if I could choose for the second time, I would opt for a program in a different field. For example, in law, maybe in journalism, maybe in uh, in economics, in uh, uh, politics, uh, in public relations something because everybody who studies there um, if they are you know if they are uh, good <laughs> students you, uh, so they can obtain a lot a lot a lot, a lot more um, than just uh, studying as a translation or interpretation students because you get one more so to speak one more job in politics in law in uh, whatever else but you also get a great just perfect uh, language training so a lot of people who finish um, law or public relations or economics they can be translators just as well 
translators, sometimes even interpreters, <laughs> if they work enough. So um, it's not really, uh, it's not really, um, it's not really, you know, well, it doesn't have, it doesn't make really much sense to get, to get, to go, to, to go and get the translations degree. If you can get one more job, something a little bit more practical and be a great expert in languages and maybe not linguistics, but languages. Um, I think that's much more practical. That's much more, you know, down to earth and uh, it's much more um, easy. It's easier to, um, to, uh, you know, to live with it, to work with it in real life and to get, of course, more money for it. Because those kind of people, they really um, find themselves in this world very quickly and they are very um, appreciated as great, as great specialists in their fields and as language experts. And of course, as, uh, you know, international communication experts, because everybody in this uh, university has great training in international communication as well. So that was uh, my story, and I would like to. I would. I would probably make this choice if I had, if I could. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I understood it correctly, so it's better to start to choose. I don't know law or economics, and on the bachelor level, and uh, automatically you will get uh, translation, international communication, and public relations uh, to this. Um, how to say in this field in this discipline. Sure. Uh, you won't probably get a lot of theoretical training in translation, but you I don't think you really need it. Uh, you just uh, you will be just a very great, well, very well versed specialist who can speak perfect, um, let's say English or German or Arabian or whatever else, because you can you, you, students are given different languages. So it's a great opportunity, as you, as you can see, not uh, being able to speak only English, but um, having uh, having this chance to learn something else, some other Asian languages or maybe African languages even, or some, um, you know, something um, related to Spain or Italy or European languages as well. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Daria. It was a really pleasant talk. So I think uh, we've got a lot of information about this program and about uh, the university. Thank you so much. Have a nice day and see you. Bye. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bye.